Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Let's begin the comprehensive news analysis for today with the first article that is about the recently held meeting of the GST Council. Now the GST Council held its first normal meeting or the first regular meeting after a break of nine months. In this nine months, between this and the last normal meeting, we had a lot of new developments in the GST. For example, there was the all important judgment of the Supreme Court of India, which said that the federal powers of the union and the states are equal and the GST council cannot be used as a platform by the union government to enforce their will on the state governments. After all of that, the GST council meeting was organized and there were a lot of expectation that a lot of these issues will be discussed. The interesting part is as per this article, Unlike the earlier meetings of the GST Council, where the states which were mainly ruled by the non-BJP parties and the centre government were actually face to face. However, in this GST Council meeting, that did not happen. There was not a lot of complaining. There was not a lot of confrontation. Rather, it was a pretty good meeting where all these different issues were discussed. Also, there were two very, very important takeaways. Number one. In the GST Council meeting, the GST rate was hiked on a number of commodities. And I'll give you an example of that as well. The second biggest thing that was discussed in the meeting of the GST Council was the demand by the state governments to further increase the GST compensation period. Now, we have already discussed multiple times what is the GST compensation. We will discuss that again just to give you an idea. Now, I know this is a bit of a blurry picture, but this is what is available on the website also of the government. These are examples of the commodities where the GST slab have increased. As you can see, printing, writing, drawing ink increased from 12% to 18%. Then power driven pumps, machinery for cleaning, grading, seed, grain pulses, etc. All of these commodities saw a huge jump in the GST slab. That also means that the government is still not getting enough GST as it has expected. Because of that shortfall between the expectations of the government and the total collection, the government is now planning to increase the GST slab on a number of commodities. Now let's come to the more important issue, that is the GST compensation. Now as all of you would know, GST came into being in 2017 to replace most of the indirect taxes that we had. The major difference, however, between the GST and the earlier taxes was that earlier the indirect taxes that we used to have were based on manufacturing. Meaning that if you have a manufacturing unit, let's say in Karnataka, then you will pay your taxes to the Karnataka state government. If the product after being manufactured in Karnataka, let's say used to go to Bihar, and it was consumed in Bihar, then the tax would be given to Karnataka government because it was a manufacturing based tax. But now GST is actually a consumption based tax means the state government where the product is being consumed, that government will get the tax. So in this same scenario, Bihar government will get the GST tax and not the Karnataka government. So obviously, when the GST came into being, the manufacturing states were very, very unhappy with this. States such as Gujarat, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu that had invested a lot in their manufacturing infrastructure, they were unhappy because now they would lose out on a lot of revenue. This is where the central government came in. Because the central government needed support of at least half of the states to pass the GST amendment bill, what they did was they promised that at least for the next five years, that is from 2017 to 2022, if there is a shortfall in your revenue, that is, if you earn lesser money from GST as compared to what you were earning earlier, we will compensate you. This is what the central government had said. How would the central government compensate? By imposing something called the compensation cess. Now the problem is that this five year period is coming to an end and the state governments are saying that we want this compensation to be extended. Why? Number one, they are saying that we did not get enough compensation during the COVID-19 pandemic. So for those years, you have to compensate. Secondly, the states are saying that it was expected that after the end of five years, the GST revenue will increase to such a level that we would not need compensation. That has also not happened. So all in all, the state governments, most of them are demanding that this compensation that we were promised should be increased. Also, how was the compensation calculated? Means how was the state tax collection calculated before the GST? 
that was calculated by taking the base year of 2015-16 and every year it was increased by 14%. Whatever was the shortfall, the central government had to compensate that. The state governments, as I said, however, are not really in favor of this. As you can see, in dozen of states have asked for exchange of the GST compensation, but no decision has been taken. This is about the most recent GST council meeting in which the decision was not taken. So there is still no clarity from the union government side whether or not they would extend this GST compensation thing even more or not. Now the interesting part is, although the central government has not said that we will be compensating the states further after this as well. On the other hand, they have actually extended the GST compensation cess, meaning that the central government will get the money in form of the GST compensation says, but that money will not go to the states. So where will that be spent? The central government says that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to take a lot of loan from the market because the GST collection was very, very low. People were not buying anything. Economic activity was almost zero. So to compensate that, to pay back those market loans that we had taken, not just at the central government level, but also at the state government level, the compensation says will continue. Whether this money will be used to compensate the states or not, that is still not clear. But at least the compensation says will still continue till at least March 2026. The next article that we have here is on a statement by the presidential candidate that is Mr. Yashwan Sinha. As you know, he is contesting the president's election in the upcoming elections. He was giving an interview in the state of Chhattisgarh where he was asked about the sedition law which is placed in section 124A of the IPC. He was asked his views about the law and he said that such a law should not have any place in a democratic country such as India. As you know, the sedition law has been in the news for a lot of reasons. The section 124A of the IPC says sedition is bringing or attempting to bring into hatred or contempt or excited or attempts to excite disaffection towards the government and criminalizes it, even attracting a life imprisonment for the violation. This is how strict the sedition law is. In the past few years, sedition law has been used or misused to arrest a lot of people, even though they have only criticized the government and not the nation as a whole. This is why this particular law has been in the news, so much so that even the Supreme Court of India recently asked the union government whether or not the sedition law should be taken away. When the Supreme Court of India asked the centre government about their view on the sedition law challenges that were brought forward to the Supreme Court, the centre government responded to the Supreme Court by saying that we need some more time and we will respond about what is our view with respect to the sedition law. So there's still no clarity whether or not the sedition law will continue to exist in India or not. It will be seen in the coming days. Now, because this is such a relevant and such an important topic, let me give you a bit of detail and the background view about the sedition law. Now, as most of you would know, this is a colonial era law, mainly introduced by the British to ensure that the Indian freedom fighters, be it Tilak, Mahatma Gandhi, etc., do not have the freedom or the authority to criticize the British government. A lot of them were actually arrested, sentenced because they were found guilty under this law. Thus, it was expected that once we become independent, we will realize that this particular law was made against the Indian leaders and thus it does not have any place in independent India. However, the unfortunate part is that even today, more than seven decades after our independence, the law still continues to thrive in India. The law was originally drafted by Thomas Macaulay in 1837 and later on became a part of the Indian Penal Code under Section 124A. As we had earlier discussed, the definition of sedition is given in Section 124A of the IPC. The word disaffection as used in this definition also includes disloyalty, feeling of enmity, but Comments which do not excite or attempt to excite hatred will not come under this section. This is the line which is the most debated right now. If I express my dissatisfaction, let's say, against a government policy, or if I express that I am not happy with a certain government law, 
does it mean I am exciting hatred against the government or not? Because this is one of the criteria that has been used by the authorities to arrest a lot of people under this law in the past few years. As per this section of the IPC, this sedition charge is a non-bailable offence. Punishment under this section ranges from imprisonment up to three years to a life imprisonment, to which a fine can also be added. Also, once you are charged under sedition, you will be barred from holding any government job in the future as well. Also, when we say that the sedition law has still not been removed, you can't blame any one single government in power. In the seven decades of India's independence, we have almost every big political party in power at some point of time or other. That is why the blame has to be shared by everyone. Also, the reason why a lot of people still support the sedition law is they say that there is a lot of importance of this law in the sense that it still puts reasonable restrictions. And reasonable restrictions are a part of even our fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression. Under Article 19, you do have the right to express yourself, but that also comes with certain restrictions. And thus, those restrictions have to be imposed here as well. Secondly, this is a law that will ensure unity and integrity of the country. Since this law has strict punishment, it would discourage people from undertaking such offences or such activities which go against the nation as a whole. This also ensures that there is stability of the state maintained. Again, one of the reasons why people are not going ahead or indulging in these kind of crimes is because there is a fear of the law. And that is how the stability of the state is maintained. This is the point of view of those people who support the laws such as the sedition law. However, there are a lot of issues that outweigh all the significance. The first major issue is the origin of the law. As we discussed, it was introduced by the British specifically to cut down on the freedom of expression of our freedom fighters. So having the same kind of law under which our great freedom fighters were arrested to exist even today and to arrest people under that goes against the conscience of the country. Also, even our own constituent assembly was not really in favour of this. And that is the reason that the sedition law is not a part of our constitution. Rather, it is in the IPC, that is the Indian Penal Code, which is a much older document written by the British. The Constituent Assembly did discuss this matter, but they were against this idea of sedition being a part of our constitution. Thirdly, even the Supreme Court has said multiple times that such laws such as sedition must be used very, very carefully. In the Kedarnath Singh versus the State of Bihar case of 1962, the Supreme Court of India said, with respect to sedition, that acts involving intention or tendency to create disorder or disturbance of law and order or incitement to violence should only be covered under sedition in a limited manner. All other applications of the sedition law should be barred as per the Supreme Court, which does not seem to be the case right now. Also, it goes against our democratic values. If you actually look into the nations across the world, most of the democratic nations do not have this kind of a law, which gives a lot of freedom to the government in power to arrest people, even if they are just criticizing the government. So that is why this particular law also demands a rethink from the side of the government as well. There have been some recent developments as well with respect to this law. Let me tell you about those as well. It was in Feb 2021 that the Supreme Court said that a political leader and six other senior journalists could not be arrested just because they tweeted some unverified news. This is not sedition. In June 2021, that is last year, the Supreme Court again protected two Telugu news channels from any action by the Andhra Pradesh government by emphasizing that sedition has its limits and the government cannot misuse the law. Then we had the case in July 2021 when a petition was filed in the Supreme Court to relook into the sedition law. That is when the Supreme Court had said that yes, there have to be certain restrictions on the freedom of speech and expression, but it should be within the realm of reasonableness. And that is where this entire question of whether sedition should be taken away or not evolves. The next article that we have is about the government's decisions in two spheres. Number one. The government of India has hiked the import duty on gold. Now, there are multiple reasons for that. 
the government has said that in the past few months the gold import has increased exponentially in india due to various reasons because of which a lot of our foreign exchange is going out because of which there is a lot of pressure on the rupee as you know the rupee is depreciating at a very very fast pace and is touching an all time low every single passing day also it amounts to a huge problem of the current account deficit all of that combined means the government had to take some steps and the step that the government has taken is that the import duty on gold has been increased to 15% from 10.75% the second step that the government took which is apart from this news that is the government imposed some additional taxes on the export of fuels including petrol and aviation turbine fuel now let me tell you the origin of that particular story now as you know india imports most of the crude oil for our requirements however there is certain domestic production of crude oil that does take place in india now what happens is even that crude oil that is now being domestically produced in india it is being sold to the oil companies at a much higher price why because the domestic producers are saying that we will also sell it at the international rate only as a result of this what is happening is the domestic producers of crude oil are making a huge amount of profit because they are selling within india also at international prices that is why the government has come in and government has imposed additional taxes on them to cut down on all their profit that they are making also the government had said that from now onwards the domestic production of crude oil that happens if you are exporting that you have to prove that 50% of it at least is being sold in the domestic market only meaning that you cannot just take out all the crude oil from india and then export it outside at a time when india also needed in large numbers so if you are exporting domestic crude oil you first have to prove that 50% of the outbound quantity of fuel has been supplied in the domestic market in the current financial year also you cannot make huge profits you cannot sell domestically also at international prices so we are imposing new tax on you this is a cess of 23250 rupees per ton on the crude oil that the government has imposed so as i said two separate news one import taxes on gold have been increased and second the export taxes on domestic fuel have also been increased the reason why it is being done as i said is the gold import in india has surged in the month of may many many times now there are multiple reasons for that ever since the beginning of the ukraine russia war we have seen that the stock market is on a steep decline in fact the sensex had reached an all time high of 62000 a few months back and now it is lingering much much below the highest level also the inflation is increasing meaning that the people right now in india do not have a lot of places where they can invest their money and hope for a good return so a lot of people are now turning towards gold as an investment instrument because of this there is a lot of demand of gold that has taken up in the market as compared to other saving instruments and that is why as a country we are having to import much more gold as compared to earlier as we discussed the news was partly about gold and partly about the crude oil as i discussed the crude oil that is being produced in india cannot be sold at international prices because that would be too too high also this is a graph to show how much gold do usually countries import now you might have this perception that india is one of the largest importers of gold in the world when you say one of the largest you are true but if you say india is the largest importer of gold that is something where you can actually go wrong so let me show you the exact data about country wise gold import number so this is till 2021 switzerland by far is the largest importer of gold in the world followed by india which is very close to uk china hong kong singapore etc so as long as you write india as one of the largest importers of gold that is fine but the largest would be incorrect so do keep a fact check on that news as well the next news that we have of our importance is a statement by the national human rights commission chairperson that is justice arun kumar mishra where he said that india's nuclear policy reflects our past ideology now he was speaking at a conference titled the human rights in indian culture and philosophy where he talked about indian nuclear doctrine as well
this is a very very interesting and important topic from the examination point of view as well so it gives us a chance to look into what exactly is india's nuclear doctrine is it good is it bad and why is it the way it is right now now as you know nuclear doctrine means a set of guiding principles using which the country usually operates its nuclear arsenal when we talk about our nuclear doctrine the one most important thing that all of you would know is india has a no first use policy no first use policy means we have decided that we will not be the first nation to use a nuclear weapon against any other nation meaning that if a nuclear weapon is used against us then yes we will respond with a nuclear weapon but we will not be the first one to use it now as i said nuclear doctrine means a set of guiding principles which dictate how a nuclear weapon state would use its nuclear weapons during both war and peace this is to communicate to other nations also what is our policy stand and what can they expect now as you know 1998 was a landmark year after which india enunciated a doctrine of no first use of nuclear weapons now this doctrine was formally adopted by the government in jan 2003 and simply says nuclear weapons will only be used in retaliation against a nuclear attack however there are a few exceptions for example if a country uses a biological or a chemical weapon on india then also in return india can use nuclear weapons so it's not that we will only use nuclear weapons against a nuclear attack india has made exceptions for chemical or biological weapons as well so india's nuclear doctrine does come with certain exceptions it is not a unconditional no first use policy if you look at other nations across the world there is a surprise for you the surprise is that china is actually the only nuclear armed country to have a unconditional no first use policy while india's no first use policy comes with certain condition as i said that we can use it against chemical or biological attacks then we have nations as france north korea pakistan russia uk and even the us that have policies which allow them to have the first use of nuclear weapons in a conflict then the case of israel is different because israel has never publicly admitted that they have nuclear weapons now the interesting part here is as with china no country usually believes their stand because in the past it has happened multiple times that their official policy is something different but their acts on the ground are entirely opposite to it with respect to india our no first use policy has been helpful for india to get entry into multiple nuclear power related groups and also sign multiple nuclear treaties as well because the world realizes the fact that india has never gone against its own guiding principle although there is no international law that is stopping us so this policy has been of good use for india we have been able to sign nuclear deals for example with nations such as us such as japan australia all because india has lived up to this nuclear doctrine that we have of ourselves also there have been some questions raised on this particular policy for example in 2016 late defense minister manohar parikar actually said that india can think about the no first use policy and reframe it but then he clarified that it is my own personal thinking and it is not the government of india stand the defense minister that we have right now shri rajnath singh he also made a similar kind of a statement a couple of years back when he said that right now we are committed to no first use policy but the future can be a bit different now the problem is from being a country which does not have a no first use policy it is much easier to opt a no first use policy but the vice versa is very very difficult so for india that has always had a no first use policy to say all of a sudden that now we are removing that policy that will raise a lot of questions that will also not go well with india's current global esteem that is as i said india has been able to be a part of multiple nuclear treaties because of this doctrine also also we are living in such a neighborhood that any such policy decision can be taken adversely by our multiple neighbor and that is why yes there are questions and suggestions about a rethink on our nuclear policy and nuclear doctrine but in reality to change it will have multiple implications simply because we are living in such a neighborhood right now these are all the important news from the newspaper today now a couple of practice questions number 1 
explain India's no first use nuclear weapons doctrine. What are the possible implications of any change in the doctrine? Second, GST Council has a potential to repair the grudges between the center and states in India. Comment. Both the questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.